to the music and entertainment buzz. I'm Frank Capitelli, the host of this new e-show. And we have the legendary Greg T. Walker here with us today. And we're so proud to have you here, Greg. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> we have so many questions about your life. You have such an interesting life. And uh, i like to start out with uh, right from the beginning with telling you, asking you a question like, how, how was it growing up as an American? Well, I didn't grow up on a reservation, so um, I have a different set of circumstances. My parents had, you know, moved from the country eventually into the city. I'm the youngest of four children, so um, I grew up in pretty much regular old neighborhood America. But we spent summers, weekends, and holidays, you know, back over on the farm, as we called it. My uh, mother and father both grew up about eight miles apart, so I had both sets of grandparents you know, very close together. Yeah, I went to regular schools. Uh, I, I didn't have the reservation life, so wasn't talked about a whole lot, to be honest with you. Okay. Was it was the, was, was did the uh, like were you with your childhood? Was uh, was you had friends and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Were they interested in it? Were they ever inquisitive about? That you were an American Indian? Did they ever get into that? No, because I'm a Skogie Creek from the eastern branch of the Florida Creek Nation. Um, you know, the stereotype is riding the horses across the plains and shooting <laughs> buffalo bows and arrows. We didn't have buffalo in the south. Yeah. Hey. And, uh, yes, we used bow and arrow and all that. Yeah. But we had European contact, you know, 500 years ago. Right. And what we see in the movies was more recent when the horse culture moved from pretty much Mexico up into Texas and up through the Southwest and beyond, it's, it's typecast. And you think these um, you know, real dark-skinned um, feathers flying kind of thing. You yeah, know? right, right, right. We were a different culture. We were a woodland tribe, all the Southeastern tribes. So it's, it's a lot different. We had, since we had the contact so much early on, we went from buckskin to cloth, calico, and things like that much earlier than some of the others did that got contact from whites later on. So, no, it, you know, I didn't stand out it really any different. You know, I, I pretty much was homogenized and blended right in. Blend right into the American culture, okay. Okay, now let's get into when you this, you found out and you just, and you realized that you had the talent to be playing music. How old were you? And did you take lessons? What did you do? I, I did. Uh, <clears throat> about five and a half years old, I got um, or five something like that. I got a little ukulele, you know, a little blonde finished ukulele like that. And within a few days, I was picking out what made sense, you know, a little melody, you know, three or four notes, and then right, right. two-finger chord, and like, hmm. And uh, my mother, more than anyone, thought, hmm, gee, maybe he's got something here. I began piano lessons at about five and a half, and um, then I started picking up guitar, you know, I'd learn one chord, then two, and then I finally got Three chords. Well, back then, three chords was a song, you know. And um, being the youngest of four, as I mentioned, my brother and sisters were, were dating, you know, when I was still a kid. And uh, one of my brother-in-laws, still one of my brother-in-laws, uh, knew four or five chords, taught me a couple <laughs> more, and yeah, then I started right. showing him things. Yeah. But by the time I was 10, I had my very first organized play-for-pay band yeah and um, and never look back never stopped I mean it, and it was regular we were very serious we were playing the burger joints and skating rinks and bowling alleys and in you know, the school cafeteria and the little you know fifth sixth grade talent shows and it just kept going and going and going and we were very very serious then about um, 11 or 12 the Beatles came out and I went to see them I think I was 13 years old in the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, and I sat there with the girl that I had, it was five bucks a ticket, I mowed yards for weeks, you know, and <laughs> and I saw her at, uh, at a class reunion a couple of years ago, and she reminded me of something. I was sitting there, and I said, that's what I'm going to be when I grow up, and she said, what? I said, that, you know, 
I mean, I'm going to be there when I grow up. And she said, well, you're already doing that. I said, yeah, but I'm going to be that. You know, the big league, as I was yeah, thinking. Right, right. Yeah. And she said, well, you're already in a band. You've been in a band like for three years already. And yeah. I said, well, true. I said, that's what I'm going to be when I grow mm -hmm. up. And, and you know, I just really, I never look back. Yeah. So out of, out of everybody when you were younger, who was the main influence of you? Like, who would really, like, Oh, clearly yourself? the Beatles. The Beatles. Absolutely the Beatles. I mean. Anybody, anybody on a personal level? Anybody on a personal level? No, I, I have to say I had, you know, about the most wonderful parents on the planet and, you know, a huge extended family. I had a very normal, happy, healthy childhood. So life was grand to me as a kid. I, I had a great childhood. I, I don't have any bad stories like, oh, you know, it was tough and we were hungry. You know, I right. had a very normal, happy, healthy childhood. Good. So well, all of my elders were influences as far as people. I understand. Of course, you know, you have the Yankees. Everybody liked the Yankees. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know there was another ball team. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, Mickey Mantle and Roger yeah. Maris and all those people. Yeah, right. I got to meet Roger Maris years later. And, right, right. Oh, just, you know, what a treat that was. Yeah, especially the Yankees. Uh, back then, I know I'm probably the same age as you are. Yeah. And that was the big thing back then. And other than the Beatles, uh, prior to that, because my brother and two sisters were older, I heard music all the time. You know, I grew up when it was Pat Boone and when Elvis came out and the Drifters and the Platters and that late 50s, early 60s. And I don't know that that was necessarily an influence, but it sure was embedded. Right, right. You know, right. It was, I was brainwashed. <laughs> but when the Beatles came out, it's like, and now I've got something to sink my teeth into. Did you ever, did you get, uh, when they first came here, they went to, they went to New York to the Shea Stadium. That was a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. Were you there at that? Or? Oh, no, no. No, you didn't get to see that? No. Uh, it was many years later before I ever went out of the state of Florida. Yeah, so yeah. you were older. So, but, but that is the main influence. Well, I remember the event because it was so well publicized, yeah. just as uh, Ed Sullivan was. Yeah, Ed Sullivan, uh, the, the people from Ed Sullivan, from what I remember. I remember the guy who used to do all the, the staging for Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. I knew the guy personally, and at the time I was young like yourself, and uh, he was, happened to be my friend's father, and they're the one who did all that scaffolding for all those amplifiers in Shea Stadium. I've got part of that on a DVD that I, I bought a few years ago, and it's just like I remember when I saw them. It was complete pandemonium. You couldn't hear anything. It was just a roar. It was, just, it was a happening. You didn't care. Yeah, you were there. Screaming. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The girls were out of their mind. You couldn't hear it. You know, <laughs> they had little amplifiers, you know, just tall little box amps. Yeah. And, oh, gosh. You know, yeah. Sharing microphones. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 Well, well uh, I know you play, you said you, you start out with a ukulele and some guitar and piano. Uh, any other instruments you play? Yeah, I started saxophone lessons uh, seventh grade. I was 12. And wound up playing first chair sax by the time I got into probably ninth grade on through high school. At one point, I switched to drums in the school band because I didn't want to carry a saxophone. <laughs> and drumsticks were a lot cooler. Yeah, right. <laughs> Girls love drumsticks. And I went back to saxophone, I think, the last year. And, uh, you know, eventually I went from the regular upright piano that I learned on. Yeah. I got a far piece of organ. Also drums, of course. Um, all of us that wound up in Blackfoot years later had played as kids. So we had all played guitar, drums, keyboards, and sang right. and everything else. Actually, bass guitar was the last thing I learned. Okay, and that's the, that's the instrument that you played that's with Lennon Skinner, right? Am I correct? It almost backfired on me because yeah. I, I formed the band Blackfoot. It was my idea to assemble childhood friends. We 